Obviously an important thing for him. He's won multiple Legacy Opens. He's won two Legacy Opens, I believe, in this building. Yes. So he's very at home here in Cincinnati. But we're going to turn our attention to Jeff Hoogland and Andrew Tenjum. You've got Junk Midrange versus Black Green Devotion. These guys are very, very, you know, well aware of each other. They both play in a lot of the same tournaments. Jeff from Bloomington, Illinois, not Bloomington, Indiana, and then Tenjum from Madison, Wisconsin. So those guys are right around the same area. You know, if they're not playing against an each other in an open series are probably playing against each other in a PTQ. So this should be a lot of fun to watch. And don't forget, these two guys, along with Rill, very accomplished in Legacy, as you did mention. And we can't forget, Joe Lissette, even though he didn't have a great yesterday, he's here today. Mm -hmm. He's in third place right now in our open series leaderboard. He's traveling, 103 open series points. He didn't have a great day yesterday, as I mentioned. He was a little bit under the weather. Uh, we saw him kind of walking around yesterday after he basically dropped from the tournament saying, Joe, you need to go to bed, man. Yeah. You got to get ready for the miracles tomorrow. Joe sounded a little rough. And playing a full day of counterbalance Sensei's Divining Top under the weather does not sound like a day in the park for me, but if anyone can do it, it's Joe. Yeah, as we like to say, he was built to do that. Yep. He could play that deck in his sleep. I think the only way the opponents get a chance is if he is a little bit under the weather here. So it looks like Jeff is going to be taking a mulligan, and Andrew looks like he's probably going to be okay. Jeff, your, your second seed, so he has the option to play or draw. He mulliganed right away. Tension looks like he's going to keep his. So interesting little take here on Mono Black Devotion, just splashing green. This isn't much of a surprise. A lot of people tried this pre-Born of the Gods. Vidanto Ajaya, I know, put a lot of work into Black Splash Green Devotion decks. Yeah, I mean, people were splashing for Abrupt Decay, for Vraska, for a card like Graves of the Granite, you know, trying a lot of different options, but just really tough to keep together with Temple of Mystery and Golgari Guildgate, along with Overgrown Tomb. But now, what a world of difference Temple of Malady makes. Yep. And I feel like we're just starting to scratch the surface of decks that could be splashed or incorporated. You know, we saw this when Born of the Gods first came out, Temple of Enlightenment, enabled splashes of Afara and Detention Sphere in Mono Blue Devotion or in White Weenie Strategies. Now we see this weekend Andrew Tenjum splashing green to much success in his Black Devotion list. Jeff Steck, although Junk Midrange has existed before, definitely facilitated and improved by the additional Scryland. So I think as we d go forward in the standard season, we're going to see a lot more decks like Tenjum have had success. Who going to take a look at his cards? And he's going to play a Temple of Plenty. As we are underway here. And the semifinals of our standard open here in Cincinnati. Tenjum with just an overgrown team before passing the turn back. Jeff, going to take a draw. This is a Godless Shrine. He passes the turn back. It looks like. We'll see. Most likely representing Abrupt Decay. Jeff Steck is fairly soft to Pack Rat. Again, he does have some answers, like, with, like the aforementioned Abrupt Decay, but. Pack Rat is a card that Tenjum could potentially run the game away the game with. I like Jeff's played that turn a lot, too, because, you know, he has Corsair of Griffix in his hand. He has Advent of the Worm. Like, ideally, what he's going to do is, you know, he plays Abrupt Decay and his mana is kind of tied up for the rest of the game. Now, I'm a little surprised not to see him play Corsair that particular turn, but at the same time, he doesn't want to walk himself in removal spells. So, this is a thought seize. You're going to see Advent, Elspeth, Abrupt Decay, Corsair, and then a Forest. So... And, and Tendrum had Pack Rat in his hand on turn two and elected not to play it. So both of these players showing proper respect for the tricks that they're representing. We'll see what Thoughtseize is going to take here in just a moment as Tendrum does go down to 18. 18 all here between the two players. Again, this is a very big match for both of these guys with the open series points in the line and the fact that these guys do travel. And, you know, if, if they don't make it in season two, that's okay because we have the overall... We have season three, of course, and then we have the overall at the end of the year. So a lot of work to be done here for both these guys. Really, really important match early in the year. You see Thoughts is going to take care of the courser here. Jeff obviously had the opportunity to cast that last turn. Chose not to. There's a Mutaval going to fire in this Mutaval. Abrupt Decay can not take care of that. So Hoogland's going to go down to 16. Looks like he may have picked up another copy of Admin of the Worm as he'll just pass the turn back here. A little surprising there to see Tenjum select the Corsair Crufix, the lowest impact card in the hand, most likely. There is Admin of the Worm. It'll be taken care of by Devour Flesh. Hoogland's going to gain five life. That could certainly end up mattering in this game here. I'm going to see Hoogland play another copy of Temple of Plenty. That card's going to go to the bottom. We're passing the turn back. You see a Thoughts he's picked up by Tenjum here. I think we may have a response. There is a copy of Admin of the Worm. You're going to see Elspeth along with Abrupt Decay, the cards left over here for Jeff. 
There goes the Elspeth, just an abrupt decay. But he's got a lot of big draws at this point. Yeah, and Tension was pretty lucky to pick up a Thought Seize as that turn, although I'm sure he wished he had double black, because if Elspeth hit the table in this spot, it would almost certainly be game over. Again, Jeff's deck is pretty interesting. He has a card like Blood Baron, Archangel of Thuna, Johnny, all cards that he could draw to at this point. More importantly here, though, Tenjim is having a lot of difficulty with his mana. It's not even clear that Tenjim has Hero's Downfall in his hand, even if he picks up a second black mana. Mm -hmm. And those Muta Vaults do not provide much of a defense, even as Chump Blockers. Remember, the Advent Token tramples, so... And the Advent does not take much time to get the job done, either. It appears that Tenjim does have Abrupt Decay in hand, so if he does find a black source of mana, he's fine. Will Andrew do any attacking? I suppose it's kind of free at this point. I'm going to take two. Who can going to take a draw here? Looks like he picked up another land, so he's kind of just trying to ride this uh, Advent of the Worm to victory. Going to attack for five more. Tenzin's going to go down to six. Let's see if he can find a black mana. He does, but it comes into play tap. Oh. It's a Temple of Melody. And Tenjim is going to end up falling to one from this Advent attack next turn, potentially, but one is not zero. He's going to be trying to hold on now. Don't know if he has any interest in maybe trying to just chump block a little bit with Muta Vault, soak up some of the damage as Jeff just drew a Banishing Light. And he is just going to take five, go down to one. I think he needs his mana. Draw a card. It's a Swamp. All right. He can function now. And Jeff's missed enough draws in the row, just lands and removal spells, so... Yeah, a lot of, a lot of missing there for Jeff at that point. There's a pack rat. Now that'll bite it from the abrupt decay. We know that. So there that goes. I'm somewhat surprised to see pack rat get cast that turn as, uh, you know, Andrew clearly has to use a removal spell this turn on the advent token. And he could have tried to set up a situation where, you know, he plays pack rat with the ability to make one in the face of a removal spell. Mm -hmm. So the timing there was a little odd to me. Jeff with a huge top deck there in Blood Baron of Escopa. Obviously a fantastic card against Tenjim's deck. This is going to force his hand to have a Devour Flesh very, very soon. Mutavault can be on chop, chump blocking duty, so he's not dead just yet. This Tenjim just going to pass the turn back here. Jeff going to draw a Temple of Malady and scry right now. Hey, Tenjim can also double block. That's true. It looks bad, but again, Jeff's hand, just a land and a Banishing Light. Does Jeff want to wait here to find a removal spell? And he does. You like that play? I do, because, you know, Andrew's in a position now where he has to leave up four mana for the rest of the game. So the cost is pretty big. And if Jeff finds a hero's downfall or a number of cards, he just wins the game. Yeah. So no big rush. Well, Jeff going to untap. He kept this card on top. I wonder what it is. An Archangel of Thune. So he's going to play a Banishing Light right now because he wants to make sure that then Aurora Connections doesn't get to do anything in this game. Yes, Tendon's at one, but we do know that Mono Black Devotion can gain life, so good to get that off of the table. Let's see if Hoogan wants to play this, uh, play this Archangel right now. He can play the Temple Guard in his hand, untap, go down to 17, drop down this Archangel. Certainly an appealing play. Yeah. Keep in mind, you know, he doesn't have to worry about thought seeds for the rest of the game, uh -huh. at, at least for now. Normally there's an, uh, you want to err on the side of just casting stuff against Mono Black because of, of thought seeds, but with tension at one, no longer a good consideration. Huh? And there is your Archangel. Still like the no attacks? I would still wait. Okay. Let's see if Jeff is as patient as you are. And he is. As he moves down to 17. Again, you compel Tenjim to leave up four mana again next turn if he doesn't have Hero's Downfall. If he does have Hero's Downfall, it's not much different. Hero's Downfall does take care of the Archangel, so Tenjim will draw a card. A copy of Desecration Demon shows up to the party. Not a big deal there. And see, this is the upside of, of Jeff waiting here, is that... Tenjim cannot deploy the Desecration Demon this turn because he needs to keep up four mana total to keep this Blood Baron at bay. Underworld Connections drop down here for Tenjim, but again, he is at one, he is at one life. 
Now, the reason that's important, obviously, is again, in case he does in case he does gain life and he does have a Grey Merchant in his hand. Devotion would be at four. He'd go to a pretty safe and comfortable five. Remember, Jeff's got a lot of big draws from this spot here. He has Ajani, Mentor of Heroes, Elspeth, Obsidat. No end of big draws. Let's see if Corsair get him through his deck a little bit here. Here's a Swamp. That's a scavenger use. That's not so bad either. Corsair going to be coursing right along, making sure that Jeff only draws spells at this point. If I'm Jeff, I still like to wait here. Yeah, I don't think too much has changed that attacking is necessary. Yeah, those those two those two swamps that have to stay up to activate those muta vaults are a cost that Tendrum has to pay as long as Jeff has that Blood Baron back on defense. There's no reason to let him off the hook just yet. Yeah. And he is just going to stay patient. And Tendrum can't activate that on a roll connection, so he's just going to tap and take a draw here. Drew another Swamp. Now he's going to play Desecration Demon. Doesn't change things too much at this point. And you see an untap here and a draw of scavenging. Let's see what Jeff finds. There's a temple. That's going to push him up to 19 and let him scry. Getting closer to some of these big draws. There's an advent of the worm. Speaking of big draws. Yeah. And this is part of the thing. This is one of the things that I really like about Jeff's deck is just the power level of his draws is very, very high. Yeah, there are some light synergies in the deck, but often it gets in a spot where it just has its mana and then more meaningful draws than the opponent has. Yeah. Scavenging so is going to come down. Another powerful draw. You see the creatures in the graveyard. There's a pack rat hanging out, Archangel of Thune and Jeff's side, as well as an earlier Courser of Crufix. So looks like we're going to see him remove some cards right now to play around Bile Blight. And he's going to sacrifice here and come across with both. You see Muta Vaults. They're just on chump blocking duty now. Yep. I like that attack a lot. Yeah, Jeff has done a really good job of, of navigating this game. Now he's in this spot where Tenzin is just in a ton of trouble. He has. Devour Flush Protection for the Blood Baron, uh, an Advent on top. Life total very high. Yeah. Looks like Tension picked up a Thought Seize for this turn. He's off, his Blood Baron's off, also safe from Devour Flush because of Corsair, so it forces Tension to have Removal Spell plus Devour Flush. Really, really like it. Yeah, and also have an answer to Advent. Uh, you know, it's all sorts of trouble. Desecration Demon Trigger goes on the stack. Good to go, and for seven. Pukin is going to go down to 17. An aggressive move. Now, this is a great merchant. This is going to be a gain and drain of six. So, Tendrum is going to go up to seven. Pukin is going to go down to 11. Scary thing about Mono Black, they can kill you out of nowhere. Now, he's going to go down to six. Is that another gray merchant? That, I think that may have been, yeah. Oh, boy. Oh, wow. Adam and the Worm to draw. There's his backup scavenging use. He might be able to steal this one. Jeff has to be very careful. Here's an attack for four. Tenzin's going to go down to two. Hoogan's going to go up to 15. If, if Jeff doesn't sacrifice this desecration demon, he just, just dies. dies. And even, I mean, even if he does. <laughs> I guess the ooze on top of Jeff's deck is quite good for him. It's so. very, very good, but will he know? If he doesn't sacrifice, he actually just dies straight up. Demon will come across. Jeff, yeah, I would do a little math right now. Yeah. What are the ways that I can lose this game? Spoiler alert, it is lethal. <laughs> yeah. What are the ways that I can lose this game? How important is my courser right now? I have to imagine Jeff sacrifices here. He's going to play Advent of the Worm. I think he may sacrifice the 5-5. Five five. He's going to just sacrifice. Okay, the Corsair to this. Heads up play. It's not an easy one to make. No. Better to have the Corsair in the Reaver than the Advent token as well. Advent obviously is a bigger card, but because he has Scavenger on top of his deck, 
yeah, that's really important. Two big factors. Risky to draw a card here for your Tenjum. Well, he's working with perfect information. Again, Hoogland is his hands up, and he knows that the draw step is scavenging his next turn. So if Tenjum's committed to playing his Grey Merchant, then he knows that he's relatively safe. Got to imagine that's the case, too. Yeah, he's not dying on the way back. Yeah. Here is a Grey Merchant. Devotion's eight. Hoogland's going to go down to seven. Tenjum's going to go up to nine. There's Golgari Guildgate. Two uh, copies of that in Tenjum's list here to supplement the four temples and four overgrown tombs. Jeff draws scavenging off the top of his deck right away. The nice thing here for Jeff is the Advent of the Worm can still attack in this situation. And that's exactly what it's going to do along with the Blood Baron. So it's presenting a lethal attack. He needs to block with at least one here. Yeah, I think he can He can safely put both Grey Merchants in front of the Advent of the Worm. Take no trample damage. Because mm -hmm. he's only going to lose one Grey Merchant right. anyway. So it's a pretty safe double block. Jeff with no cards in his hand. So Tenjum going to go down. Jeff going to go up from the Blood Baron. See, that total is 11 to 5. Jeff with Scavenger is in play. Still has to consider sacrificing a creature. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, you know... The most obvious thing to do is sacrifice a creature here, but Jeff does have to concern himself with if Tenjin cobbles together multiple running removal spells, mm -hmm. one of those which being Devour Flush, as Jeff loses creatures, he's potentially getting to a spot where his Blood Baron is exposed to being killed. Triggers on for Desecration Demon. Decisions, decisions. If you sacrifice, what do you sacrifice? Well, to me, what makes the most sense is... Oh, well, it's probably the Advent token That's at this point. That's what I think, too. The Scavenging Ooze is going to be much larger than a 5-5. Five -five. Mm -hmm. So much in the graveyard. There that goes. Jeff a little unsure of himself. You can tell. Yeah. These it's, are tough plays. Demon moves up to a 9-9, nine -nine, but he can't use it right now. Tenjum, mostly bricks in the hand. I know he has a thought seize. I think he's just got a couple of lands over there as well. And he can't even really use the connections at this point because I don't think he has anything in the hand to kill that scavenging use. So he's not even trying to devour flesh. Yeah, and if he activates connections, it goes down to four. He's just facing lethal. So Yeah, he would have to draw a gray merchant. Um, he would potentially devour flesh himself. Mutaball gives him a chunk block, but it's pretty slim. I yeah. mean, we're not talking about a lot of productive draws from this spot. But what is the plan otherwise? Because the blood hit better and is going to hit regardless. Yeah, but we're locked into that happening now. So the upside of finding something like Grey Merchant this turn feels like it's probably worth using Underworld Connections. Because I'm not sure what the plan is otherwise. And you might just be forced to do it. Because if he finds Mutafault, then he gets two looks at it next mm -hmm. turn. He's going to go down to four. Take a draw. This is a Did copy of Devour Flesh. Okay. All right. See, two Thought Seizes, a Swamp, and a Devour Flesh here. Tentum just passes the turn back. It's time to go oozing. Jeff going to remove a bunch of cards here. Yeah, no storage of green mana in, in Just Graveyard also, so. So ooze. Eats a bunch of stuff. Looks like five creatures. Jeff going to go up to 16. Pretty comfortable life total now for him. Jeff going to take a draw here. There's a course of Grufix. Hugan going to get some information. Top card of his deck coming. That's another copy of Admiral of the Worm. Not shabby. Yeah, these are attackers. Ooze is a 7-7. Great Merchant. Going to fall underneath that bus. Here's a Devour Flesh. With the blocks, of course. So. He's still alive. Tenjum just gets another turn here. You see Grey Merchant gets in front of the ooze, and he uses Devour Flesh to sacrifice itself. Game two. Hoogland's going to go to 20.
Now, Jeff may actually be able to just accept the Desecration Demon hit next turn to keep another threat in play. I think he can safely accept it this turn. It's unclear what the Courser really adds because Jeff has two lethal attackers and the Courser itself is not lethal, but... Pendulum gonna take another one. And I think that Tenjim is finally done in. And it drew a pack rat. And it's kind of crazy to think the pack rat is not good in this situation, but it's not. So Jeff Hoogland is going to win game number one here against Andrew Tenjim. A hard fought battle between Junk Midrange and Black Green Devotion. But Hoogland able to get the job done is we're going to bring it back to the booth here, my friends, because it is trivia time. Six month giveaway time is what we're going to do. Patrick got the question for you. I've got the rules. Pretty simple. Get your Twitters ready. At SCG Premium, excuse me, hashtag SCG Premium, at SCG Live is what we're looking for on your end. He's going to ask you a question. Won't be too tough, I don't think. No. Just don't make it involve the Clippers. That's all I ask. Yeah. Thanks, good guy. Um, we're going to announce the winner at the conclusion of our semifinal round. So, again, it is about accuracy, not speed. And do remember that all giveaways that we do here at Star City Games in, in no way involve Twitch.tv. Uh, it's just something that we're doing on our end for you guys for our premium giveaway. So, Patrick, for a six-month question. So Andrew Tenjim, uh, splashing green in his Model Black Devotion deck, most notably for Abrupt Decay. There's also a single copy of a Black Green Planeswalker in his deck. Name that Planeswalker. And if you can, again, hashtag the answer, SCG Premium at SCG Live on the Twitter sphere. As we're going to head back to the match here, don't forget we'll announce the winner at the conclusion of our semifinal round, which likely is going to take a little while because I haven't heard anything about the Christopher O'Brien, Eric Rill, blue-white control versus blue-red control match. Might be a little slow. You think uh, the Firemind's Foresight match might be a little bit on the Just slow side. a touch. And Eric Rill's a fast player. This so. is true. This is true. Christopher Bryan is, is no slouch as well. We're going to look at Tenjim's side first. Two Dark Betrayals to Devour Flesh, two Doom Blades, two Golgari Charms, two Farika Cures, two Erebos, God of the Dead, and four Duress. What do you like there? I like a lot of this stuff. I think he's going to want the four copies of Duress. Maybe not all four, but at least some of them. There's Advent of the Worm in that list. Uh, there is, of course, the Planeswalkers that are quite threatening. Devour Flesh, additional removal, and additional insurance against Blood Baron of Viscopa, which was the card that did in Tandrum in the first game. Uh, even the Doom Blades are reasonable. There's all sorts of Archangel Thunes, Scavenging Goose, Corsair Crufix type of cards. You can even make an argument for Dark Betrayal because of Obsidat. So all, all sorts of options for Tandrum here. I think he's definitely going to want the Erebosis as well. It's a slow matchup. His removal spells are very good. He's probably not going to be in a ton, under a ton of pressure, so more sources of card advantage, quite valuable as well. On Jeff's side, you, you see two Life Main Zombies, two Sin Collectors, an Underworld Connections, two Bio Blight, two Golgari Charm, two Putrefy, an additional Obsidat Ghost Council, an Erebos God of the Dead of his own, and then two Thought Seizes. What do you like for his options? Discard, Erebos, the Sin Collectors, the Underworld Connections, just more card advantage and more discard. Pretty straightforward. It feels kind of like a Mono Black Mirror-esque matchup. Yeah, Jeff has a lot of four and five mana creatures of wild, wildly varying power level. Uh, Advent's pretty good, although susceptible to Abrupt Decay, as we saw you know, a couple times that match. Blood Baron is really his big haymaker, though. That's a card that puts Tenjim on, onto the test to have Devour Flesh. And even Devour Flesh isn't going to be good 100% of the time because Tenjim, uh, Hooglin, rather, has so many creatures he can potentially sacrifice. Yeah. See both players sideboarding and shuffling up here. Don't forget as well, my friends, after... This round, we have, of course, our finals. We'll give away 12 months of premium. Then we'll do a winner's interview with whichever one of these fantastic players does hoist the trophy. Short little break, and then we'll jump into legacy action, which should be a blast. Don't know how Journey and Nyx is going to infect things there. Be interesting to see. Well, there is Ley Line of Sanctity on a creature. That's true. That's true. Another, is that another death and taxes target, potentially? Another... Another hate bear? I don't know. Yeah, wouldn't be wouldn't be too surprised uh, to see that card see some play there. Eidolon and the Great Ruffle and Burn Decks. Don't know if that's really going to put Burn Decks on the map or not, but we'll see what happens. I think it's a very good cyborg card. Uh, I would be I, if I were playing today, I would definitely have at least three copies of that in my sideboard at the minimum. I can promise you this: if you want to see Counterbalance and Sensei's Dividing Top, there's a very good chance that will happen. Mm -hmm. As Joe Lissette is here, and Assuming that he's feeling a little bit better, but I think he can do it even a little bit under the weather. That's uh, that's his bread and butter format, yes. and that's where he's looking. It would be incredible to see him qualify for the Player Championship based solely off of his legacy work. Well, you know, it, it, a big part of that, if he were to qualify, would be his invitational performance. That was split format. Agreed. And Agreed. he was the first overall seed. So, And Joe has, I believe, two standard open wins as well. Mm -hmm. So. 
He is no slouch. He definitely has a reputation of being a legacy specialist, but he's put in a lot of good work in standard as well. Again, a lot of history on the line for these players. Tenja and Hoogland battling it out in the top four right now. Both of them playing in their sixth Open Series top eight. No wins. And Eric Rill looking to tie the record of five held by Jerry T, Todd Anderson, and Redo. Pretty prestigious company to potentially be added to. And let's not forget either, last summer when we were in Somerset, Hoogland, Tenjum, both top eight in the same Invitational. Mm -hmm. uh, Tenjum losing in the finals to Eric Smith. Hoogland actually putting a deck on the map that weekend, kind of the base black splash green deck. Really, it seems like the first one to put Desecration Demon on the map yeah, was that, that weekend. Uh, yeah, that, I believe that is the case. Yeah. So you see both players taking a look at their openers. This is a, a temple from Tenjum. Top card is going to go to the bottom as game two is underway. Jeff has a temple of his own. Both players scry their top cards to the bottom as Tenjum is going to play Golgari Gilgate before passing the turn back over to Hoogman, who, who will draw. A lot of Haymaker fives here in Jeff's hand. Blood Baron and Obzadat and now Ajani. And Johnny, yeah. He's just got to make it to that point. There is another copy of Temple of Silence looking at another Blood Baron. I wonder if you keep that one. Well, you know, De Tenjum's already shown that he doesn't really have much in the way to discard. Just going to put it to the bottom. Tenjum off to a very slow start as well. Another overgrown tune before passing the turn back. Jeff draws a copy of Golgari Charm. That'll take care of Underworld Connections. Or a stray pack rat at this point. I think Jeff considering playing a land tapped or untapped. He is going to play that one untapped here before passing the turn back. Now you see his hand. He doesn't actually have anything to do with three mana, but he's kind of bluffing like a hero's downfall, things of that nature. Putrefy potentially, just yeah. something to keep Tenjum off of casting a disintegration even that turn because Hoogland's hand is not well set up to handle this card right yep. now. And Tenjum just casts it because what else is going to do? Yeah, the odd thing here is that by doing that, Jeff actually puts himself on a three-turn clock. Yes. And obviously, it did not stop Tenjum from casting the Desecration Demon because it is attacking for six right now. Hoogland's going to go down to 12. Yeah, the question is, what else is, is Tenjum going to do that turn? If he's not casting the Demon, he's yeah. got to cast it at some point. Tenjum looked like he wanted to cast something. Now it looks like he may have changed his mind. There's a Swamp. And that's another copy of Desecration Demon. This one could be over before it even begins. There's Advent of the Worm from Jeff. Thoughts he's picked up. It's not even clear that, that Jeff can cast Blood Bear in this turn. Yeah. And in fact, he does have to sacrifice a creature every turn now to the Desecration Demon unless he gains life. So playing that dual land untapped to bluff, coming back to haunt Jeff. Desecration Demon, a pretty good magic card. It's true. Pretty good. Easily the best Punisher slash Tribute slash whatever type card by yeah. like a wide margin. It's just so big. Although still definitely has spots of being low impact. Jeff going to play a Johnny. He's going to make this into an 8-8. Eight eight. Come across here now. Of course, he is forced to basically sacrifice the worm that he got in the damage. If with. he even gets that far, I mean, yeah. if it's tension matter removal spell, the game's just over. Yeah. And for six we go. I wonder if it's going towards. Doesn't matter. <laughs> I was gonna say, what if it's going <laughs> towards a Johnny or Jeff? But Tenjum's gonna show you a great merchant, and just that quickly, things do end. So Andrew Tenjum, after a very long and compelling game one, makes short work of Hoogland in game two, and we're gonna go to a third one here. That is the. Issue with this junk mid-range deck, I, I, I've played against Reed's build of it online. Jeff's a little bit different, but still kind of a derivative. The games where it does not have Sylvan Karyatid, it often takes way too long to get out of the gates and do anything. That doesn't matter all, all the time against Mono Black Devotion, but that game it certainly did. Yeah. Eric Rill does win game number one over Christopher O'Brien. Blue-white control, a traditional approach, up a game over the wonky blue-white-red control deck. We'll have the opportunity to move over there most likely after this one is done, unless something kind of strange happens in game number two there in Rill's favor. Yeah, I would be surprised if that game got was ended before game three over here. Yeah. 
control matchups, sideboarding games, they don't take too long, but we'll see what happens between those two players in a bit, as again, we are pretty sure we'll have time to jump over there. But these two players, Tenjim and Hoogland, one of them will be in the finals with the opportunity to win their first Open Series title. We'll see which one it's going to be. Tension with the more traditional approach here. We've seen black-green devotion before. Again, just touching green for Vrask and Abrupt Decay. Hoogland side something completely different. Um, we saw Reed Duke kind of work on this deck along with Gerard Fabiano, but this is, you know, pretty different altogether. There's just a lot of powerful cards here in Jeff's deck. You really like it. Yeah, uh, you know, I said before, there's some light synergies. Some of the pieces are nice and interlocking, but a lot of this is just some removal spells, some mana acceleration, and then some of the best five and six mana spells the format has to offer. Again, if you haven't seen Jeff's deck or his deck tech, definitely head over to our coverage page. Nick Miller sat down with him in the sideboard yesterday. We also had three other deck techs. We wanted to get as many to you guys as we could, given that there's a brand new set out, obviously. So a lot of people are trying a lot of different things. Or at least looking for inspiration from other places yeah. before they start brewing by, them, by themselves. So Hoogland will be on the play here. Tension number 16 on our season two open series leaderboard. Everyone working their way towards qualifying for the Players' Championship at the end of the year in Roanoke, Virginia. We've already got two people qualify for that one, obviously. Brian Brondwin and Derek Sheets. And Eric Grill making a really big push this weekend to oh, yeah. oh, get yeah. added to that roster. Things are really, really going to heat up here for the next couple of weeks. Real is making one heck of a push. Lissette is traveling. You know Van Meter is going to be traveling. Mm -hmm. That's a guarantee. So we're going to see what these players are capable of here. It's going to be a lot of fun to watch over the next couple of weeks. We're going to be in Columbus in June before you even know it. I mean, it's, it's May already. You know. you know, we've got next week in Knoxville, then the, the week off after that for the state championships. So... And the state championships that are taking place by Star City Games, those do give open series points as well, so I wouldn't be surprised to see a lot of those players at this anyway. There's a, a week off for the Pro Tour, period, mm -hmm. because we turn, our we turn our focus towards that tournament, but there is the ability to actually go to a tournament that weekend and get open series points. And for a lot of people on our Season 2 leaderboard or people who are playing for Season 3 or the overall, that really matters. Jeff taking a look at his hand. Looks like he might be a little land light. It's one land and someone carry it but mulliganing against mono black is so tough because of all the discard spells. Yeah, the only, the only thing here is I, you're, you have no guarantee that your Sylvan character is actually going to live. Yes. Because of Devour Flesh, and that alone would make me want to mulligan. It's just a huge risk to take. If you get Thought Seized, if Tendrum has Devour Flesh, mm -hmm. or if you miss your second land drop, I mean, there's a lot of things that can go wrong keeping this hand. And you want to give yourself the best opportunity to actually play magic in this situation. And Jeff is going to mulligan. It would have been a hero's downfall and then a temple garden, things of that nature. So, no, I, I think that that hand only works if Jeff draws the land on turn two. And it probably has to be an untapped land as well. Yep. And his deck does not have that many of those. Truth be told, I think I think that's the situation. I think you're putting it pretty modestly. I think it has to be running lands there mm -hmm. to actually for him to have a chance. And I wouldn't want to open myself up to that. Well, he had Courser and uh, Sin Collector. So he had a real hand with three mana. Yeah, if he, if he ends up with three mana, yes. It's just, you know, I think the chances of, you know, being Thought Seas Devour Fleshed are so high mm -hmm. that the Sylvan Carriage is basically a blank card. And, you, and that hand, you basically have to draw two lands to function. Yeah, although, you know, there's how good is you how good are your chances of winning if you mulligan and he has Thoughtseize or Devour Flesh? If we're already presupposing those cards are in his hand, being those on a mulligan while you're on the play are not that's not easy as well. So I don't think it's quite as simple as yeah, obviously you mulligan, but I do think that Jeff made the correct decision. Six cards coming for Hoogland. Yeah, see, this is the kind of hand I like against this deck so much more. I like the fact that he's just got a bunch of lands, and if, it gets, if he gets targeted by a Thoughts Seas or a Duress, it doesn't really matter. This is what I prefer. I prefer land-heavy hands in this matchup. Yeah, because at least at that point, you have top decks that matter. Yes. They can go after your hand. They can't stop the top of your deck. And if I've already got the necessary lands, then all I'm supposed to do is just draw spells. Here's a pack rat that Jeff does have an answer for in Abrupt Decay. He's going to put Temple of Silence into play. Looks like the top card may be a Courser of Crufix. He's going to put the top card on top. We'll find out if it was Courser's or Brupticay. He's going to take care of the rat. Tenjum will take a draw here. And no shortage of really powerful draws in Jeff's deck once he has his mana online. Mm -hmm. 
Lifebane Zombie's gonna miss. You see two copies of Overgrown Tomb, a hero's downfall, and an Elspeth, and we'll see exactly what Jeff kept on top of his deck in just a moment. Yeah, this is a very durable hand against a mulligan. Or after having mulligan, rather. There's, of course, her top card, Mana Confluence. That's going to come into play. Jeff will gain a life. There's a Swamp on the top of his deck. So, Working his way towards Elspeth here. Yeah, he has the mana. Tension will untap. He'll take a draw. Looks like he picked up a copy of Grey Merchant. Life Ain't Zombie can't be stopped, so in it comes. Hookum's going to go down to 18, wishing he could block with the Courser. See the tension of his Desecration Demon this go around, even though Jeff does have a copy of Hero's Downfall at the ready. This could be an Underworld Connections, which would be pretty good. Yeah, Connections is really good here. Just giving Jeff, uh, or Andrew rather, more shots at a discard spell before this Elspeth comes online. Top card, Golgari Charm. So there's your answer to the Underworld Connections. Well, if he Just wants a little to, late. Well, if he wants to answer it that way, it means he's not casting Elspeth next turn. That's true. Overgrown Tomb will come in. Jeff's going to go up to 19, so long as he doesn't remember the trigger from the Courser. And in for two, he comes. This looks like it's going to be 19 after the Connections activation to 17. These are really big draws for Tenjum. Jeff at the ready with that Hero's Downfall, too. Tenjum draws a Hero's Downfall of his own along with a Doom Blade. And the Hero's Downfall in Tenjum's hand is basically reserved for the Elspeth. I would have to assume so. Mm -hmm. Jeff going to take three here. Good on a 16, looking for a better choice for Hero's Downfall. That's probably reserved for a Desecration Demon. I don't know. See, if I'm in Jeff's spot there, you're going to definitely want to cast Elspeth next turn. So do you want to take another hit from this, uh, from this Lifebane Zombie? So uh, it feels like he's almost certainly just going to use that Hero's Downfall at the end of the turn anyway, and I'd rather just use it now. Keep your life total high. Yeah, and if he plays Desecration Demon, it's not even that big of a deal because you're casting Elspeth. You're going to have some tokens to work with at least. Sure. It seems like your life total doesn't matter against Bundle Black, but it really does. Oh, it and certainly we saw does. Those incremental, that extra two points of damage was certainly really meaningful. And, uh, you know, he's going to be taking a point of damage here at least off of Mana Confluence to cast this Elspeth if he wants to do that this turn. See Jeff's top card is a Sylvan Carrier too. That one's not gonna matter too much. So his next draw is basically dead. So now the question is, do you cast the Elspeth or do you cast the Charm on Underworld Connections? You don't want Tenjum to get too many cards here. If you if you cast the Elspeth now, you're basically giving Tenjum two more cards. Yeah, and Tenjum did nothing on his turn, so you have to believe the hero's downfall is on the radar. Yeah. And casting this Elspeth into the Maw, the Hero's Downfall, allowing Tenjum to connect untapped, connect again, it's rough. You see Jeff really taking his time figuring out what he wants to do in this turn. He's working with very few resources here in his hand. But he's definitely got some big draws here. And you see he just wants to play the Swamp, and he's going to drop down the Elspeth here. Not going to take any damage from Manic Influence just because he played a land. So no. <clears throat> there is Elspeth. It's going to bite the dust here in just a moment. See some soldier tokens here from our IQ program coming into play. And no attack in the face of double mutable, which does make sense. Tends to going to draw. He's going to Hero's Downfall that. Now he gets to untap. Just this is a really good series of events for Andrew. Yes. Get to draw. Another copy of Underworld Connections. He's got a lot of gray merchants too, so mm -hmm. Tenjin might be just setting up that kind of kill. There's a swamp. Looks like five mana. It is gray merchant time. This will be for four. Jeff gonna go down to twelve, Andrew up to sixteen or excuse me, up to twenty. Very potent blocker here, holding off Jeff's entire team. Sylvan Carried had added. Blood Baron on top. That's a start. That is a start. Now, Tenjum has kind of the same setup that we saw last game where he has access to two copies of Mutavault to potentially hold off. But it's, of course, harrowing to try to double block against a deck with so much removal like Jeff's has. Mm -hmm. There's Sylvan Carried.
Gonna pass the turn back, probably with the intentions of charming this after the activation. Jeff has not played land yet this turn. I'm not quite sure what the upside of holding it is. There's no guarantee you untap with the Courser in play, so. Yeah, I want that life, because as you mentioned, every life matters. This is gonna go up to 13 here. Pass the turn, activate that. Here's Charm, probably gonna fire off. I would like to, th wow, is he gonna let this go? He is. That is surprising. I mean, is he trying to, he's saying stop. I think he wanted to cast that when he was tapped out. Yeah, tension was okay. Tension was a little quick to untap, so okay. I see both players come to an agreement there. And now he is cardless, is Hoogland. So everything's on the table, and the top card of his deck is known. Tension's the one with all the options and all the cards. Pack rack connections, another gray merchant, a lot of tools. I think Tenjum has the tools to win. He's just got to carve out a game plan now. I mean, at this stage, switching gears and trying to pack wrap makes a lot of sense to me. Seems like it. With two Muta Vaults out there. And a Grey Merchant in hand. This yeah. is, it seems like the tools are there to just go down that road. <laughs> Looks like he might be going down another avenue here, however. Well, he can play Connections this turn and pack wrap mm -hmm. and untap and then start kind of doing his thing. Four mana. No, three. There's connections. Gonna draw right now. Old tension. Go down to 18. Looks like he picked up maybe a life pain zombie. Just gonna pass the turn back with Doomblade at the ready. Yeah, I think he's gonna stop Hooglin inside of his draw here. Yeah. Get the information. Take care of that. And what he's doing there is in his draw step after he draws his card, before he goes to his first main phase. He's casting that Doomblade. The reason for that is so that he can actually gain the information and know what the top card of Jeff's deck is, which is a temple. And you can imagine, for example, if the top card was Avid of the Worm, Andrew may not want to use the Doomblade at all. Uh -huh. So he gets to find out if there's a land there or if there's something he'd rather save the Doomblade for. So Bloodbearer has shown up to the party. However, that Two Mutavault game plan again from Tenjum. Definitely working in his favor. There is a swamp. And he is connecting away very well. Looks like you might see Pack right now. Against, against Blood Baron, it is often Devour Flush or Bust. You rarely get to see someone just overpower a Blood Baron through Pack Rat activations, but I think Tenjum is sending himself up this game to do exactly that. Jeff does play his temple and looks like he might just be a little bit too far behind now. And that tapping was great from Tenjin there as he left up the two Muta Vaults and two lands. So if Jeff attacked with the Blood Baron, Andrew could simply double block and go on with life. Uh -huh. But since he didn't, now he gets to make a rat and Jeff's in the same spot next turn. Kyle. There's a temple from Tenjum. Top card gonna stay on top. Two mana. It's another copy wow. back, right? Yeah, he's really gonna overwhelm him now with this game plan. Jeff gonna draw a card as a courser. It's a little too low impact at this point. There's a putrefy, also low impact. And Jeff can't, yeah, yeah. he's and tapping. He knows, he knows it right away. He can't come out from underneath the pack rat onslaught. And Andrew Tenjum with black green devotion is moving on to the finals. We'll see who he's going to play against between Eric Rill and Christopher O'Brien. I know we're going to be headed that way in just a moment.